Harriet, thank you so much for joining me. And I might just give a little uh, background as to our conversations before we came onto this podcast, just so that people know yeah. what we are dealing with, Harriet, here before we go into your content. Um, okay. We are both dealing with barking dogs. I've got noise in my garden. We've had doorbells going. We've had all sorts. So we had to sort of start again, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> so that, but that is life in lockdown that you have to roll with the punches and you have to just adapt and also I think maintain a sense of humour at all times. Absolutely but what was lovely was I got to meet your doggy online oh. what a gorgeous little animal oh lovely. Oh. I know she's a, she's adorable and I, I really feel sorry for people who are um, who are quarantining without without a furry friend to, yeah. to cheer them up. Absolutely, absolutely. But you actually, I mean, we are in lockdown at the time of recording. I'm hoping by the time this goes out, we won't be locked down so far. We will be looking back and thinking, gosh, I barely remember that. But uh, let's see, we will review. But you've been busier than ever in lockdown. And um, I'm going to ask you a bit more about that later. But first, I want to talk about some of the areas that you specialize in. Yeah. Um, areas that maybe business leaders and people should consider a priority and perhaps aren't. So, Talk to me about, because I mentioned this in the introduction, talk to me about self-doubt and disempowering patterns. What do you mean by that and why is it so important to be aware of them? Yeah, well, I think that there's actually um, an epidemic out there of people not feeling good enough. Um, and, there's, and it's a combination of lots of different pressures on people. Um, you've got the, the constant measurement culture that, that tells people you've got to always be better, be better, be better, or you're going to get left behind. There's the pressure from media, social media. Um, there's perhaps who knows what's happened in, in people's life earlier on, parents, critical partners, all this kind of thing where they started to doubt themselves, especially for women. They've got the pressure on how they look. Uh, you know, you, if you see any female politician or member of the, you know, famous person, it's never about their work. It's like, oh, well, you know, did you see what Theresa May was wearing? Um, the, and so there's this feeling of, am I good enough? And often the answer secretly in people's heads is no, I'm not good enough. Um, and except on the outside, they might have a high powered job or they might have an awful lot of good things going on for them. In fact, if you looked at their social media, if they have it, their Facebook or the, their Instagram, you would think they've really got it all made. They've got this good career, maybe a partner, lovely home, social life, holidays, maybe a family, all these kinds of things. And so they've got this secret self-doubt, but on the outside, they've got an incredibly shiny life and they've got to hold it all together. And that's where the disempowering habits come in because they've got to bridge the gap somehow between the two. Um, and they've also, um, sorry, that was a message just popping through that ping. Um, They've also got to um, make that voice go away so that they can get on with the shiny life and keep delivering. And that's where you might see things like um, drinking, drinking too much, drinking too often that can come in. And that's been happening a lot in lockdown. I've had a lot of people saying, Do you know what, I suddenly noticed I've become, you know, a, a glass of wine a night person instead of just at the weekend or a bottle a night person. And we seem to be just cracking open a bottle every night and before you know it, it's gone. Um, it could be emotional eating. Um, and again, this has been absolutely rampant in lockdown. Everyone's been talking online about how they're, you know, eat, just, just eating their way through it. Um, and so people are eating on their feelings, but then they feel even worse about themselves because they think, well, why did I have that drink when I didn't need to? And I feel a bit foggy headed today. Why have I been emotionally eating? It could be shopping. Um, it could be, you know, you've had a bad day, you're not feeling good about yourself, maybe you've had criticism from your partner or your boss and, and it's made you think, well, maybe that voice inside that says I'm not good enough is right. Maybe I've got caught out. It's where the imposter syndrome side can come in. And then that, that advert for the thing that you've been looking at, the dress or the gadget or whatever it is, pops up again on your phone. You go, yes, actually, I, I will have that thing because it will make me feel better. So it could be shopping. It could just be scrolling. It could be staying up too late watching Netflix. Um, and not getting enough sleep. It could be saying yes to absolutely everything so that you're ultra busy and you never have time to stop and actually feel how you feel. But all of these things, those kinds of disempowering, destructive habits, they don't actually cure the self-doubt. They make it worse and they feed into a sense of complete overwhelm um, because they feed that critical voice in your head. They feed the not good enough um, and, it, and it's like a downward spiral. So the solution that people apply to not feeling good enough makes them feel even worse rather than even better. 
oh my god I think I've done all of those things <laughs> well exactly it's so relatable isn't it and so much of it is so socially acceptable isn't it yes. you think someone you know a girlfriend's had a breakup and the answer is well we should all go around to her house with loads of wine and ice cream and you know blah 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 and we should watch a movie and and it's just so socially acceptable to numb your feelings and to pretend that you're okay when you're not okay um and and um when i do talks on emotional well-being and i bring up this idea of you know when people you ask someone how are you and they say i'm fine the higher the tone in their voice oh it's fine the, the less fine they actually are um and actually in the um in the rehab community um down at the priory and places like that they'll tell you that fine stands for fucked up insecure neurotic and emotional so <sighs> when you say you're Usually. fine you're not fine Okay, okay we'll sorry, little, yes, you used a naughty word. You've got word. to we'll bleep put, that out. No, we'll put a little warning to say there's a naughty word, but I, I'd never actually heard that uh, that definition, but that's interesting because I, I will often say fine or okay when I don't want to sort of go deeper. But also sometimes you don't, you, you feel you don't want to burden people with stuff anyway. But so, so if you're helping people with this kind of, these kind of issues, it, that surely must be on a one-to-one -one basis rather than a group basis. Or can you help in groups? Sometimes group work is even more powerful than one-on-one -on -one because you get the me too factor and people realise it's not just them who are secretly feeling worried about what their body looks like, whether they're good enough, whether their home is good enough, whether any of these, this long list of things is good about them is good enough. And when they realise that it's not just them, there's this huge sense of relief and also the shame around it goes. Whereas if you do the work one on one, yes, perhaps someone gets more attention and you can go quite deeply into this. But um, I've had time. So I'm thinking in particular, I gave a talk at Sky um, on turn your inner critic into an inner cheerleader last autumn. And when I started to bring up some of these not, not good enough things and just ask people to raise their hands about the kinds of things their inner critic says to them, the relief around the room that there was, you know, dozens of other people all feeling the same way meant that collectively it gave everyone permission to move forward um but in, in, in social media world it, you know your life's got to be perfect hasn't it everything's got to be great all the time and shiny and happy and fabulous and well put together and yeah mm, although I, if you're a bit like me i'm very skeptical about these things i do like to see a bit of you know humanity a bit of vulnerability yes. i want to see that yeah. i can't relate to someone who's too perfect because I could never aspire to be that person. But, but coming back to something you mentioned, you mentioned overwhelm. And I think overwhelm, not necessarily only just in this current climate, but I think in the fact that the speed of life, speed of change, speed of what's going on. Um, and also, I don't know about you, but I'm always attracted to the next shiny objects. So I've got to learn the next thing because I feel I'm missing out. I've got this FOMO thing going on. So I get overwhelmed very, very easily. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to deal with that. And I never used to. I used to be very focused. Have you got any tips on how we can avoid that overwhelm? Yeah, I think, um, well, there's two parts of this. There's proactively avoiding getting there in the first place. And then there's if you found yourself there, what are you going to do about it to get yourself out? And let's talk about the second one first. So if you are already in a state of high overwhelm um, and your head is spinning because you've got so many things to do, then um, and you just don't know which way to turn. And it feels like there's so many demands on your time that actually you want to get back into bed and cry. Um, the best thing that you can do is to stop, which sounds counterintuitive, but just stop, stop everything and do something that boosts your energy. So it might be that have a cup of tea, which is the British answer to everything. Um, have a snack, get some fresh air, go for a dog walk, whatever, something that will help you with your energy. Um, in fact, many things, throw lots of things at your energy. And then when you're feeling a bit better physically, then is the time to get a giant piece of paper and write down absolutely everything that's going on in your head. The biggest to-do list you might have ever written in your life. And not just work things as well, and all the projects you've got going on, but all the personal things as well. Because actually, um, you know, you and I, we, we both run our own, own businesses. And so per and personal is just as pressing um, as work. And you can't separate them. If you're very worried about one, you, you can't then focus on the other. Um, so once you've got it all down on paper um, and it's not rattling around your head, it becomes easier to pick through 
what to do. And there will be a number of things on there that don't even need to be on there because they've been on your to-do list forever, like declutter the loft or clean out the garden shed or get the car cleaned, whatever it is. Stuff that actually you know you need to do, but you don't need it on your list. So you get rid of all those long-term things um, that just aren't pressing and they, they'll get done maybe one day, maybe never, doesn't matter. And then with what you've got left, you say to yourself, right, what can I delegate? Now, it's not so easy in lockdown to delegate um, or to hire more help. So sometimes with people, um, with the high-flying women who are mothers that I work with, um, I might say to them, well, have you got a cleaner? Have you got enough support at home? Do you need the nanny to stay for an extra hour when you get home so that you're not immediately dumped into child mode and you've got time to get changed and have a cup of tea before you look after the children all that sort of thing which I you know fully understand is not so easy in lockdown but what can you get off your plate um, and in a work situation there's often extra support that you can call in you can and it's one of the, the things with these people who especially women who are full of self-doubt is that they think they've got to do it all themselves and they think that asking for help is a sign of weakness and whereas actually I think a great leader is able to um, know where their brilliance is and just put their time there and give everything else to other people and actually allow them to be in their brilliance as well. So you de delegate and then at that point you've got a shorter list because you've got rid of some stuff and you've delegated some other stuff. Then with what's left you categorise it. It's either an A, a B or a C and C is it can wait. B is well it would be nice if it happened today but if it doesn't the world will not end and A is super urgent this has got to get done as soon as possible and then when you've got your A's you go through them and you say well what is the priority order for these and then you know and you've got A1, A2, A3 etc and then you've got your project plan for the day and you know what's got to be done first um, and then after every item tick it off again keep replenishing your energy because one of the things that happens with overwhelm is that we're very physically depleted as well as mentally scrambled. So the more that you keep your physical energy up, food, snacks, I'm, I'm a terrible snacker, I love snacking, but snacks do work, um, and, and lots of water, not just coffee to make you more anxious. Um, yeah, see, I'm, I'm on, my, uh, on my green smoothie this morning. Um, it looks like sludge, but tastes great. All of those things will really help. And, and then you, you've moved yourself from overwhelm to I've got a project plan and I can do it and it's possible and even though you might still feel like you've got a lot on your plate you can actually get it done so that's that part of when you're already overwhelmed now how to avoid getting into overwhelm in the first place is also about making sure that you're taking good care of yourself um, and this is where the well-being first approach comes in um, because if you're meeting all of your needs um, your physical needs, emotional needs, social needs, spiritual needs, creative needs, then it's much harder to be very triggered and to, to tip into I can't cope um, because you will already be registering warning signs, little red flags. May uh, One person mentioned on a webinar a couple of days ago that they'd started to get a bit of an eye twitch, which is a mega sign for me, like tired and stressed. My eyes started twitching. That's like, okay, right, what do I need to do? Or is it that you start started feeling more anxious? Or have you been to the fridge 27 times before um, 10 o'clock in the morning? Everyone has little warning signs. And the trick to not getting into that super overwhelmed place is pay attention. When you've got those red flags waving at you like crazy, if you just stuff them down even more, then you'll get into the super overwhelmed position. So you have to, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's much better to um, not have the fire lit at all than to be constantly firefighting. I mean, absolute masterclass there. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Yeah, sorry, I just went, here's 10 minutes of... Yeah, no, it's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you. You mentioned something that um, many people will try to do it all themselves yes. uh, because they feel that, you know, uh, they have to. And actually, I think part of that also, and it's one of the other things you talk about, is because it, they know how to do it perfectly. And I know you talk about, uh, what is it? You call it, is it toxicity of perfectionism? So I, I, I believe you probably at some point were a recovering perfectionist. So <laughs> tell, tell, me, tell me about why perfectionism is such a dangerous thing um, and, and how you can spot it in yourself. 
okay <laughs> how long have you got <laughs> listen li li this is fantastic you carry I, I, on i'll tell you what i'm get, i'm gonna try not to deliver this section perfectly that's my first job right? perfect excellent uh, yeah <laughs> so the reason that i call it the toxicity of perfectionism is because i think that perfectionism does have some benefits but it also has a very dark side to it that um all the scientific research points at that causing all kinds of mental and physical health problems um, so it can result in things like depression anxiety eating disorders higher blood pressure there's anecdotal evidence as well uh, with young men who attempt to but then fail in committing suicide that they cite their failure to ever be perfect and ever be good enough and ever meet up to the standards that are expected of them as being their main reason and obviously we don't know about the young men who succeed so it's serious it's not just it used to be that jokey answer didn't it when you went to a job interview 20 years ago and they said oh what's your biggest uh, weakness or fault people would laugh and go oh i'm a perfectionist um which is actually supposed to be saying something good about yourself but i think that we've all come to realize that perfectionism is not all good yes it can push people to work harder to be responsible and all these sorts of things but it can also lead to and these might be little red flags for people um a lot of procrastination because if you're a perfectionist there's always a bit more research you can do there's always a, a, you know you can always tidy up your presentation a bit better you can always do this a little bit more and it stops people from putting themselves out there thinking their material's good enough thinking that they're good enough um and it can also be a real barrier to healthy relationships as well i don't know if anyone's ever who's listening has ever had a perfectionist boss but you you never get praise from them and you're always you, it's a bit like when you come out of an exam and instead of focusing on the you know 98 questions you could answer they just give you um give you hell for the two that you couldn't um and if you have a perfectionist partner it can mean that they just never seem satisfied maybe you can just never load the dishwasher right maybe they never load the dishwasher right um and i think we can that's something we can all identify with there's always one person in the household who has a very specific idea about things like that um so if people do notice that they always want to push themselves to achieve more and that whenever they achieve something they never actually feel satisfied they just want to achieve more so perhaps losing five pounds isn't enough then they've got to lose more there's always in a few more seconds you can shave off your running time you can always you know talk to more people it's about more 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 but inside the reason that you're doing it is because you don't feel good enough it's again it comes back to not feeling good enough i don't think that all people who don't feel good enough are perfectionists but i'm very sure that all perfectionists don't feel good enough if that makes sense that does make sense that does make sense so it comes back to the same fundamental problem uh, that we were talking about earlier so that's really interesting the uh, one yeah. issue i've got with perfectionism and people saying you know you mustn't be a perfectionist that doesn't mean to say you mustn't have high standards though because i do see people exactly. producing they're saying i'm not going to do it perfectly but then it's like yeah do it well though don't be shabby i couldn't agree with you more i couldn't agree with you more but it's about knowing when something's good enough um that it can go absolutely um, because that's where the procrastination comes in yeah, no, I, and I understand that. And I've got a pile of books <laughs> that I'm reading. I've had to pile them on the floor because my bookshelves are so full. <laughs> I, I, I have a similar pile, actually. <laughs> Fantastic. I love books. Anyway, um, we, we talked about at the very beginning that you're busier than ever. Um, what are the kind of topics that you're being asked to talk about by your clients? Well, um, for, the, for the most part, it's around... Um, focusing on your well-being and especially mastering your thoughts and emotions so that you can continue to be healthy and successful um, and also looking at how um, toxic perfectionism is playing out in lockdown um, so and and I don't know if you've seen that that meme um, you know if you haven't learned a new skill and you haven't launched your side hustle and you haven't this and you haven't that then you don't lack time you lack discipline that's toxic perfectionism um, and, and people, um, I run a poll when I do these webinars and say, what are the things that you're giving yourself a hard time about? And people are just feeling like they're not achieving enough on any level. Their home's not looking good enough. 
and everyone can see it on their Zoom calls. They're eating too much or they're eating the wrong stuff. They're not learning enough. They're not exercising enough. They're drinking too much. They're not being a good enough parent. They're not productive enough. They're not, I mean, the list just goes on. Um, and, and so I think companies have become more aware than ever that if they're going to keep the companies going, they need their staff to be well mentally and physically. Otherwise, they can't show up for their work. Um, and so the, um, the well-being first approach is what is really um, becoming apparent, actually, that companies more than ever have shifted from productivity and profit and output to actually we've got to look after the, the well-being and the mental health of our staff. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to, to work at all. And actually, I think it's not just now, but I think it's post uh, when we get through all this, whenever yeah. that happens to be and we're living in our new normal. I think there's going to be a lot of I think there's going to be a lot of PTSD. You know, it, it has. Yes. I think we're going to be faced with that. So I, it's a great thing that you're doing. So tell me, um, how are you reaching those clients? Or are they reaching out to you? A little bit of both. Um, I am very proactive. So, um, and I do like to stay in touch with my contacts at companies. Um, and so I have been reaching out to a few of those and saying, hey, um, I've been doing some webinars on this. Would it be interesting? I've had clients who work in big corporate approach me and say, we, uh, so private coaching clients come to me and say, can you please do some webinars for my team? Um, so it's been a bit of both people coming to me. Um, but also me proactively putting myself out there. And for example, there's been one or two places where I've done a free webinar um, as a favour, and then I've had uh, corporate bookings come flooding in as a result of it, um, which is great because they've said, actually, my whole team needs to hear this or I want my department to hear this. Yeah, it's so of the moment. It's so relevant. Yeah. Thank you for that. So I know that you have been working on your business as well as doing all of this and you've separated your personal development work and your corporate work. How, how have you done that? What does that mean? I think there was a bit of confusion before about who I was and what I was doing. Um, and I felt that when I was in corporate, um, that I was having to slightly tone down certain aspects of my work. And when I was in the personal development world, I had to be careful not to mention this. And I really, when I'm in either world, I want to be fully the person, the best, you know, give the best of what I can do. And that um, I think it was confusing as well on my website, like exactly who am I and what do I do? Um, and just by separating it, um, it's, it's brought much greater clarity to both, uh, both worlds about who I am and what I offer, really. Um, and so the personal development side of things is called self-love and SAS. Um, because the reason I put the sass in there is because people who are full of self-doubt and have these disempowering habits and feel utterly overwhelmed is very serious. Um, there's no room for playfulness. There's no room for feistiness. You can't ask for your needs to be met. Otherwise, everyone will think you're not good enough um, and all that sort of thing. So that's why I put self-love and sass, because I want people to get to that playful, uh, enjoy, you know, what... If, you, if you're not going to really enjoy life and get the juiciness out of it, what's the point? So th that's where the SAS comes in. But then it enables me to be very clear about uh, the talks I give in the corporate world on things like the toxicity of perfectionism or emotional well-being, um, inner critic and those kinds of things. And the, the corporate coaching that I offer, the leadership coaching and, and the well-being coaching. And say so, that this is very clearly what this is. And that's a really great idea. And it's something that we always encourage people to do, to be very clear that you have. a. Yeah. a, a, a and, and what's great is that anybody listening, if they are an individual, they can work with you. If they are yeah. a business, a corporate, they can work with you. So that's great. You have an offering for everybody. And I think yeah. that's, that's fabulous. I want to finish on something which I think people may not know you're doing. And I think it's so important and so valuable. And I, mm -hmm. I, I want to high five you for it. You're doing a lot of work to support teenage girls. Talk to me about why particularly teenage girls and, and what it is that you're doing to support them. Well, honestly, I wish that myself as a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old had met me now. Um, because I think that my life might have turned out differently and I don't regret anything. However, um, because it's made me who I am. But to have someone talk uh, talk to me that back then and say 
are you feeling not good enough are these pressures on you is this how you're secretly feeling and actually this is how you can honor yourself and stand up for yourself and it's okay to do that would have made the most enormous difference to me um, and so I do go into schools and talk to teenage girls um, it's usually anywhere from year seven right up to uh, six formers about um, how to honor themselves how to have courage um, and what self-worth for women actually looks like and some of the dangers um, and I also do work uh, I do uh, workshops on body relationships um, and um, before lockdown I was planning some mother and daughter ones mother and teenage daughter ones but obviously that's on hold right now um, and I've also am working with a much well she's 19 um, 19 year olds with um, eating disorders and helping them with the emotional well-being um, and more practical side of things um, so so that your audience knows so I'm 17 and a half years in recovery from addictions myself um, and and had a very difficult time in my late teens and early 20s and so I do know what it's like to go through that period of life feeling like you're not good enough on all sorts of different levels and to get into unhealthy relationships and to completely um, self-destruct because you don't feel good enough and you need to make those feelings go away and pretend that everything's fine. And I, I don't want any, I don't want any other teenage girls to go through that. And if I can make a difference um, through speaking in schools um, or through one-on-one -on -one work or through these mother and daughter um, body relationship workshops, then amazing. And I have to say that is probably the most rewarding work that I do of all. And the, um, I remember the first time I did that a couple of years ago, I went to speak to some teenage girls in Warwickshire out of school. Um, a few of them hunted me down. I didn't give any of my contact details out, but they found my website and they wrote um, into the contact form, they wrote what an impact my talk had made on them um, and that they were going to pin up, you know, the handout in, on their mirror and that, you know, how much it had changed their life and they were going to think about things differently. And, stand up for themselves and you know move away from certain crowds and it yeah it was just absolutely phenomenal um yeah I, th I think I would rather be remembered as someone who um proactively helped teenage girls to have an amazing life rather than fixing broken middle-aged women <laughs> however both are great both are, you know that but, but both are extremely valuable and needed and rewarding don't don't abandon us oldies <laughs> i won't i won't i won't <laughs> thank you harriet that was wonderful thank you so much you're welcome